This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co-host, Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. We don't have a process for referrals at most companies. I go into a company, I say, what's your referral process? They have no, well, what do you mean? I think that, I think that goes back to the premise that why do salespeople suck at prospecting? I mean, number one reason why they suck at prospecting is they don't actually do it. If you are successful and nobody knows in, 2000, in 2016, 20, 2025, you're not successful. If you ever want to find out what's going on in the company, get in the car and spend a day with the top three salespeople. You'll find out in five minutes. Because you can't be a trusted advisor without two things, trust and advice. I mean, you need both of them. What is going on, Real Sales Talk family? We have an awesome guest today, Matt Bertuzzi. I like to think he's the brains and the operations behind the Bridge Group. Uh, recently added author, we, guys talked, we talked about his recent book that's coming out, Lightning Sales Ops. Uh, we're now bringing him on the show so we, we can talk a little bit more and go a little more in depth. Uh, just awesome, awesome leader in terms of sales ops, sales administration, always learn something uh, from you every time we talk, Matt. I'm super excited to have you on the show. Uh, thanks for coming on. I can't believe this is great. I'm really happy to be here. It's weird to go from a listener on dog walks to being on the show. I love it. We're, we're happy to have you. So be ready. So we have exclusive content for YouTube. So everybody that's on YouTube, we're going to ask rapid fire questions at the end of this. So make sure you jump over to the YouTube channel if you haven't. Uh, we're on season five, episode eight. And it started with Katie Lance ep last episode. So make sure you check out her YouTube to see her exclusive answers as well. But Matt, happy to have you on. So tell me, tell me about Lightning Sales Ops. Tell me about the book and then let's go from there. Sure. Um, so let me ask you guys a question. You, you've both seen and used Salesforce. How, yes. How, how many, how would you call that experience overall? Do you think reps, like, do they like using Salesforce? Do they enjoy the process? Oh my God. You know the answer to this, Matt. Yeah. Uh, sales yeah. reps hate it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's antiquated, it's clunky, it's not intuitive to use. Yeah, that hurts my heart to hear it, but yeah, I, I agree, I hear that feedback too. So about a year and a half ago, Salesforce came out with, they call it the Lightning Experience, which is a, they called it like a rebirth or a reimagining of what's possible within Salesforce. And like anybody else who was at Dreamforce, you know, I sat with my arms crossed and I rolled my eyes, I was like, yeah, yeah, we'll wait two years for this to come out and be a real thing. But the more I've got to see it, like it's, it's actually kind of amazing that we can do things in Salesforce to actually make our reps maybe not happy. I mean, not, not a ton of sales reps in the world who are ever happy with being forced to use technology, but they can at least say, you know, this is a good experience. It's decent. So my book is about taking, just like keeping it small, keeping it focused on the sales development function. Them have what I consider to be an amazing and what they probably say is a decent experience inside Salesforce. So it's about building, and it's actually, it's about building an experience, building a place to go to do your work that isn't 400 clicks and 50 required fields and I can't find the things I need and there's all these codes and errors are popping up or validation rules or I'm getting yelled at from the ops people because I'm not checking the checkbox. So it's about making the people who wear the headsets, who do the work eight hours a day in Salesforce have a good experience. So maybe talk, so... For some, some of our listeners who use Salesforce, mm -hmm. they may still be on the old version because right. I know up, up until a month ago, I was still using the old version, tried to find the, the new version, but, but was not successful. So there may be some people who aren't ex have, have not been exposed sure. to the new version. Talk about the differences between the two, and then, and then maybe that'll give us a good basis yeah. for moving into you know, some other parts of the book. Cool. So anyone who's ever logged into Salesforce... <laughs> would call it a web a web tab database. Now I'm on the accounts tab and I can do stuff with accounts. Then I want to look at a contact. So I open a new tab and you know I'm doing stuff with contacts. Then I want to make some calls, so I open a new tab to to log a call or create a new event or send an email, that kind of thing. So really what it is, it was like a database that you just access via different tabs. So you wanted to do something over there, you had to go over there and do it. Lightning is much more 
and this isn't my background. I mean, I'm an ops person. It's much more about building like a UX, like a user experience. So it's Lightning is about building an app that you log into, and then everything you need is comes to you is either predictive and comes to you. You have a custom homepage. You're creating act. You're creating. You're logging calls and sending emails on the person's record. You're not leaving Salesforce or going to another tab. You're looking at campaigns and figuring out what's important before you pick up the phone without going to like the campaign tab and researching it. Or, and, and even that's generally terrible. It's about like giving the users what they want, like in one experience that's totally customizable. Where in Salesforce, like customization was like, yeah, can you move that field down? And can you not let Matt see those three fields? Like that's what it used to be. Now you can have people looking at the same record and it's completely different. Like your, your, your accounts people, finance people, they don't have to see any of the activity history. You know, like that Facebook feed of what's happened because they don't care. They just want to know, is this an active customer? What's their customer number? And are they current on billing? So it's about building an experience that like follows the job where Salesforce Classic is much more like, can we show a few different fields based on who the user is? Now it's like, can we make that record relevant to the person who actually has to do something on the record? So I have not moved over to Lightning at our company. And we, we've, we've talked about it, we've had conversations, but talk about that change management that people have started to right. go through as you move from Classic, old school Salesforce, where everybody knows how to use it, although they, they might not love it or they might love it, whatever their, their situation is, but going into this system where it's lightning, what's that change management process look like? So I think it's one of those things you gotta, gotta hit your early wins first. And for me, that's why I pick sales development because generally, like Phil, you might agree, like if, you, if, you, if somebody says they're an SDR, you know 95% of what their day is. Like you just, you know it because the job is the job. Is the job. So I, I pick sales development as the place to kind of like land with lightning experience because it's the same thing. It's working inbound leads, making outbound calls, logging dials, and sending emails. And then looking at information and, you know, you obviously interviewed for the book. You had some great feedback about putting information on the record. So the change management process is about, honestly, something I haven't done enough of and I'm ashamed of it before this book is just sitting down with users and closing my mouth and being like, oh, you got a new lead. I'm going to watch you do your, do your job. I'm like, that's interesting. You, you left to go look at that campaign to see what the campaign's all about. Wouldn't it be interesting if I could show you what it's about on that lead and you were one click away from a Google Doc, which gave you the three bullets that are most important? You know what I mean? Yeah. So the change management is about like sitting your butt down, closing your mouth, and looking at what the person does, and then being like, oh, yeah, now I see why you hate me because I made your life so hard. I think that's valuable, not just moving over to Lightning, but any technology yeah. you introduce. It's, I'm going to train you, but you almost have to train somebody three, four, five times until they totally. finally, it finally clicks and they get it. And it's, I usually do a training and I'll follow up with, I'll sit at their desk the next day and say, all right, push the button, push the button and make it flow. And yep. that's where you're like, wait, why would you click it here? I built it just so you could click it here instead. And it actually is going to take you a shortcut if you do this. So I think it's teaching the tips and tricks that you built into that system as you work through it. Uh, and I think that's super valuable. Is I'm going to sit with you today and I'll make sure you know how this works. Exactly. And the other piece is like you have to find your, your people who, do, who are happy on the bleeding edge. You know, like there's reps who love new technology and they're willing to deal with bugs. So you have to kind of get them on board. And then a rep saying, I don't know why you guys are using the old version. The new version is so much better is the best marketing you'll ever do for a new tool or a new anything. You've got, you've, you've divided your book up into sections. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how that framework is set up and the thought process behind sure. those different, those five sections. Sure. So uh, just, this is by random coincidence, I was cleaning my desk and this, this right here, this was the book. It's a stack of index cards. So like, I'm a weird nerd person and that's how I wrote a book, right? So that's I, awesome. On each card is a distinct thought or something I wanted to highlight or a problem or like when, when I interviewed Phil, some of the gems I got from Phil's conversation, Phil and Alex's conversation. So I organized the book by first taking, you know, this stack of cards, laying them out on my table, my, my dining room table and trying to figure out 
piles. Which pile does this go into? One, two, three, four, five. So the way I came up with the piles was just, to me, it makes sense. I try to say, okay, if I'm an SDR, what's my work stream? Like, what are the things that have to happen for me to do a good job? So that's why I broke the book up. Like, first, I have to make sure it's my lead. And if, even if it is assigned to me, it's not somebody else's lead. So the first section is about identifying who the right person is, round robin, account-based, however that is. Then I have to do some pre-call planning. So the second section is about planning, ways to surface information, find better information, connect with LinkedIn without making it 500 clicks and copy-paste a bunch of stuff. Then now, what I know, now I know my talk track and my themes, I'm going to do contact. How do I do outreach? If I don't have sales loft cadence, if I don't have outreach, if I don't have reply, like how do I make making dials in Salesforce go from like ugh to, it's not terrible, you know? It's, I mean, it's not as great as these other tools, but it's the be- I wanna make it the best experience it can be inside Salesforce. And then once I connect with you, how do I do that handoff to my AE with as few clicks, as few copying and pasting and writing a Word doc and emailing a Word doc, you know what I mean? Like I don't wanna do any extra work as a rep. When I pass that lead, I want to hit the gong and be on the phone again. I don't want 10 minutes of busy work punishing me for just doing a good job and booking a meeting. So like, that's how I thought about it. I thought about those work streams and I kind of broke it up that way. So I think you bring up an interesting point. So you brought up sales loft outreach, mm-hmm. all, all of the, the lead management tools that, that typically live in the, the sales development world. I'm actually at Rainmaker, which is the sales loft conference right now. Big fan of the teams that they put there. Yeah. So, Talk about that. So I'm a, I'm a fan of actually building something in Salesforce first and testing the process out in Salesforce. And then if yep. I need to optimize it and automate it, I'll look to a software, a third-party tool. So we talked about that. Of how do you start making the decision of when do you, and this is not your book, but when do you start right. making the decision of when do I pull in a, a sales loft or an outreach or, or what have you from lead management? So I think my starting point was let's make Salesforce as good as humanly possible. And then... What's like, so first, let's talk about those tools. Those tools, I would say you deploy them when you know what you want to do, who you want to talk to, how you want to run it. The people are good, and now you want to make them expand. You know, like you're, what well, they say, you're accelerating great, not accelerating blank or beep. So you bring in those tools to accelerate a strong foundation. And I feel like it's really hard to build a 60 dial a day foundation in Salesforce the way it was, right? Like, it's a lot of hunting and pecking and clicking and calling on customers. Like reps are calling your, be- your best customers and not knowing that they've been working with you since day one because they're like, oh, I didn't do that weird find dupes thing and they misspelled their company name. My bad. Sorry. You know, I've been six months out of college. No, no problem here. So it's about like once you get good, how do you get like hit the pedal down? And I think a lot of those tools like level 11, this, the ability to bring KPIs right into your face and Gmail, there's some really amazing stuff that I love, but not everybody has an infinite budget. So it's about figuring out where, you know, what's the pedals you can press. Yeah. And I think that's what, so I've skimmed your book. I have not read it all, but what I have read of it, I think that's the one thing I like about it. It's let's go build it in Salesforce first and figure it out, build the process first. And I, I'm a big fan of any software, any tech you buy is you're building the process first. Right. And you're just using it. What you're saying is then you expand it. Then you, then you hit the gas with something that, that can add fuel to the fire a little bit. Yeah. And I think like the, it's kind of dark to say, but we've been in a, what year is it? We've been on a nine, eight year expansion, right? Like this economy has been hot. It's not always going to be the case. So at some point in the future, this is not Debbie Downer. This is just the laws of cyclical expansion and contraction. People are going to have to make tough choices. Am I going to lay off people or am I going to stop using tools? So I want to get ahead of that curve and say, you can still grow if there's a down economy by working, by making Salesforce help you work smarter and better, but use these tools while they exist, but maybe someday you have to cut a budget and you don't want to be back to the stone ages of like a 2004 Salesforce process. You know what I mean? Does this address just the ops who's handling Salesforce or could an SDR or a sales manager Mm -hmm. also glean some valuable things from your book. Sure. Uh, I'd say an SDR, don't waste your time. There's a lot of, I mean, I'd love to sell you a copy, but it's just not a good fit. There's a lot, like read Joe Conrath, read Mike Weinberg, read Anthony Ian Areno, read Keenan, read all those people to make you a better professional. 
So for SDRs, I think there's, there's time spent better elsewhere. For SDR managers or sales managers, I kind of broke the book, at least in my brain, and like each section has two parts. Like I call it lecture and lab, right? Like the lecture is the theory, and this is what happens when you add baking soda to vinegar. You know, like that's, that's the part that managers can get interested in. And then when I put the syntax of a wicked long nerd formula, you can tune out the lab. That part's not for you. Just keep flipping. So I think my hope is that SDR managers can find one or two or three things and say this, what Phil said about fields on lead page layouts or what Matt did in a screenshot here, I want them to dog ear that page and hand it to their ops people. Like that's my hope. If I write this and nobody changes anything, I'm going to feel like I wasted seven months of my life. You know what I mean? I, I want people to improve, to do things that actually make reps lives easier. So this is going to be an ideal book for sales manager, sales leader to get together with their Salesforce ops guy and say, yeah. okay, let's take this and implement this, or let's take this and tweak it a little bit totally. to, to match what we're trying to do with SDRs or yep. executive, account executives. Yeah. Anybody who's making dials out of Salesforce, I think you should make that as, as easy as possible so that they can quickly get to the contact and know what the contact did on your website with your company or based on some firmographic, technographic stuff. So AEs or sales development reps, even customer success, like the people who live, the heads in the headsets, it's about making their experience better. I think that's, I think that's really one of the key points to tune into. And so for our listeners listening to this, for those that are, that are in leadership or th those that are in ops, um, this, this, this is a book that you want to buy because it's going to help you streamline your process, which then affects the sales reps that are using Salesforce so that they can output more, output more phone calls, yeah. more appointments, make it easier to add notes, all, all of those things that, that traditionally Salesforce is problematic for. Yeah. This book sounds like a, a strategy or game plan to help sales organizations use Salesforce more efficiently. Yeah. And for, for the true like ops nerd type people, it's during the process of writing this book, I had to think about UX, which I'd never done before. Right? Like I solve for process and math. I've never actually cared about user experience. So it was a good challenge, like a part of my brain I'd never activated before. So I think that's another piece is that in a lot of, usually we implement software, right? We, that's all we do. We, we plug it in, turn it on. We don't actually get to design a user experience. So this was a fun, a fun, the lightning experience gave me a reason to try to develop those skills. And I think it's hugely valuable because I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to solve for people problems. Yes, we want productivity and revenue and more dials and more ring and the gong, but it's like, I want, I want people to not hate me if I'm your Salesforce admin. Like that's, that's kind of where I want to go. So, so talk about that. So you, you talked to dozens of people for the book and you, you stretch yourself in terms of thinking through user experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, what were some of those eye-opening moments when you started having a conversation with someone you were like, wow, I, I never really thought of it that way. What's the pages that you dog-eared that you wish other people were doing today? So the number one learning that I think you'd agree with me, like logging calls in Salesforce has never been fun, right? Managing open tasks to figure out who I'm supposed to call today has been really hard because if you inherit a territory, you get like 400 activities just dropped on your head and then you're like sorting and trying to come up with codes to figure out like, who am I supposed to call today? And one day, I don't remember who I was talking to, but it kind of just hit me. I was like, you know what we're doing? We're managing open tasks when we should be managing open leads. Because the tasks are important. It's the person that matters. I, where am I with calling that person? What people do I have to call today? Not what tasks do I have to close? So that was like, I was like, well, how can we know who to call today if we don't have to worry about open tasks? Because like, I don't want to get out of hand. I'm either way, like when I was a rep, I was a task fanatic. Like my tasks were tight, but my dials were low because <laughs> my stuff was clean at the end of the day. Where people next to me had high dials and I'd look over their screen and the tasks were just, it's a nightmare. I couldn't figure out what, how they worked. So there's a happy middle, I think, where you can know who you're going to call today. And when it's due, it pops up, right? It's like the concept of 
Don't show me things I don't need to act on right now. It's basically like the surface reps concept. The soft surface reps work. They know who's, who they have to call next. They know where their cases are near their escalation points. They're working a queue. And I wanted to bring some of that bubble things up when they matter and hide them when I don't have to think about them. I wanted to bring some of that to Salesforce for sales. Yeah, I actually have. Every time I open Salesforce, I still have reminders that pop up when I was at BDR like three years ago. Totally. I have, I have it actually stopped him because I'm at the point I just, I'm used to hitting X and clearing them out. No. Wait, that, okay, that's the other thing. And maybe you guys, like, like Sean, you might agree. It's like you get the muscle memory of dismiss and ignore. Because, and once that happens, you're never going to get rid of that. It's, you're done. So how do you prevent reps from getting that, like, it's not a Pavlovian response, but like the conditioned response of pop up, don't care, ignore. It's like buyers when you, you know, when you call kind like, Hey, this is Matt Bertuzzi from the, they're like, boom, don't know you. This is a cold call. No, thank you. So it's like, how do you interrupt the pattern by making the Salesforce user experience only show you what matters now? So I don't get that condition, dismiss, forget it response. Yeah, I mean, that was the world. It was living in 50 tabs and 80 reminders. And every day I walked in, it's like, all right, I'm good. I'm going to dismiss. I'm just going to go to my calendar. I'll just work off whatever exactly. my calendar actually is. But I, I, it's crazy like that you brought that up because it's still, I laugh every time it pops up. I'm like, I really should just close those out. But. Awesome. Yeah, I hear you, man. I do the same thing. I'm an admin. So when I deactivate a user, I get their stuff. And I should go in there and clean them out. And I just dismiss it. So it's just like, it's the path of least water finds its level. That's like what we're all living with. So can, can you talk to, like, do you address those specific things? Like, how do you fix that problem so that sales reps aren't faced with that? Or like you said, they're only seeing the things that they have to do that yep. particular day. So I talk about the philosophy of managing open, ma managing tasks or managing records, not managing tasks. And I share a few stories about people who've done it. And then it gets weedy. And I say, here's a, here's like, so that's the philosophy of the lecture. Now here's a lab. Here's how you can make it easy for reps to log calls. And when they do, can magic, can automation change the status of that lead, increment the number of touches. So I don't have to remember to say, all right, I have to change it from MQL open to MQL working and create a follow-up task. I just log a call. It changes the lead status. It puts the number of touches at one. It sets the next due date to Monday because it knows I'm on an every other day cadence. And then there's a weekend coming. So that means the next day is not Friday, but Monday. And then it disappears from my list view. And Monday morning when I log in, it comes back. So I get to that level of like technical granularity. But the philosophy is the most important piece because if you're not bought in, the rest of it's garbage. I think that's great. Um, so for the salespeople who are listening to this interview thinking, what's my takeaway? The takeaway is if you're experiencing all of these problems <laughs> that we're talking about now, you need to go buy this book and pass it on to your manager and your ops guy That'd be so awesome. that they can start to save you time and help you make more money that way. Yeah, because I, I don't think there's nobody who wants, there's no sales ops man or woman who like on Saturday is like, I can't wait to go Monday and make my users miserable, right? They're just buried. And I literally, when I wrote this book, I thought I can't wait to build on the body of research that must already be out there. And somebody's written, you know, Rev1, I'm just gonna, I was being cocky. I'm just gonna polish it up a little bit, put my little twist on it. I couldn't find anything. I was like, I need to call guys like Phil and, and Amira and, and all, my, all my friends in the sales development space and admins and SDRs themselves. Like, I, I tried to at least, maybe somebody tomorrow is going to write a better version of this, but I tried to say, okay, I want to get us le from level zero to level one in this knowledge because I want everyone to, to make everybody's lives better. Like, I hate it when, people, when sales reps say, when they see me at an airport with a Salesforce bag, and they're like, oh, Salesforce? And I'm like, yeah, it's like, I hate that crap. You know, it just breaks <laughs> my heart. It's not yeah. what I want it to be. I'm always like, I was like, give them my card. I'm like, have your admin call me. Like, I will talk to them. We will get you to, to not hating it. And I think it goes back to the earlier point of, like, just going and sitting with them and walking. All right, show me what you're doing. Because right. it's where you get, like, I would wish that somebody comes proactively to me and says, I don't know how this works. Like, yeah. I know you told me three times, but... I don't know how this works. How do I make the button go? How, like when I right. press it, it doesn't do anything or it doesn't do what I, you said it was going to do. Like if someone's proactive, you almost immediately can walk over and say, well, here's why it's broken. 
Yeah. It, and I think it's like, even that as a takeaway. If you're a sales guy, like go to your ops person or your admin and say, hey, this button is broken. How do we fix it? Yeah. And it, it's something where you have the answer, or I would have the answer, whoever the person that admins that system will have the answer to their question where it's, totally. and if not, they're going to find a way to work around it or work for it for you. And right. Think, they're going to ignore it or just do it, do it their own way. Because like when we're building as managers or as leaders or as ops people, we think of the process and we build it once. We don't think that somebody's going to do that 50 times a day, 200 times a week, you know, however, uh, 40,000 times a year. We don't think about it that way. You're like, yeah, it's no big deal. It takes, it takes a minute. Well, 40,000 minutes a year is a long time. It's a lot of wasted time. Right. It's, it's the extra three steps that it takes to get to a button click. And it's like, yeah. long, like the, it was the process for ma manually pre any lead management tools where it was just Salesforce. It was 50 tabs open. 75 reminders, all this stuff. It was 14 yeah. clicks to get to log a call, 14 clicks to get to log an email. Nothing yeah. was tracking. It was all manual. Like the amount of time in my day I was spent just doing administrative stuff to get to 50 phone calls was yeah. hours and hours and hours of work to do that. Where yeah. I guarantee I missed it. I guarantee I missed 50 calls, 50 calls a week on, ah, I just didn't log it. Or, right. Or, so your manager is either angry at you because you're not doing the volume or your admin's angry at you because you're not following the process. It's like the, the reps are stuck in the middle. They're like, hey, why don't we do something crazy and make the process easier to execute in Salesforce? So that's, that's, like, that's the thinking. I think you both get that. Awesome. So before we get into the, the rapid fire questions that'll be for our YouTube channel, cool. talk a little bit about this book. This book is, is on its way out. Where can yep. someone find it if they want to buy the copy right now? Sure. So if you just map Bertuzzi on Amazon, there are only like four Bertuzzi books, one of them being Trish's. It's the one that's at the top of the rankings with the good reviews. And then there's mine, um, Lightning Sales Ops. And I'm actually going to do a preview, like a preview chapter, like a third of the book. And I'll put that on our website. And you can find that. It'll be Googleable within the next week. Awesome. So number one trick, lightning is really tricky to spell. Lightning and lighting will be your, your fingers will type those. They're just lightning. Make sure you check the spelling. <laughs> and and are are you are your services and your expertise in Salesforce hireable? Can can someone hire you if they're at a different organization and they like what you're what you're talking about? They can reach out to me. It might not be something that we or the Bridge Group can do because I mean we work, we work pretty tightly with tech companies, SaaS companies, that kind of thing. But I as I'm a Salesforce MVP, which basically means I run a user group, I offer the, my best thinking, and I speak at Dreamforce, and I have a huge network, so I'm always happy to connect people. If they're looking for like a local Salesforce admin or they want to work with a big shop or a small shop, just definitely reach out, Twitter, email, whatever, whatever works. Brilliant. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. We're going to move into the rapid fire. So the first question is, who would you say has influenced your life, personal or professional, the most? This is a, that's a good question. So I used, to, I used to actually, out of college, I went to work for Marriott. There's a lightning round, right? I have to be quick. Yeah. I went to work for Marriott uh, doing front desk, which if anyone's ever checked in a hotel, you know what I did. So I, I did that and I led a team. And my boss was like the director. And his name was Socrates Ramirez. He came into hotels as a busboy and worked his way up to now he's a GM of a hotel. He taught me to lead from the front, basically. Like, don't, you know, like those, there's those pictures of like people hitting golf balls with their employees, like a manager has got like a little, you're hitting a golf ball with your employee versus watering them, trying to develop them. And he was the first person I, I ever saw who was like, oh, there's a problem, not go figure it out, but like, let's let us go figure that out. And that's, that was huge to me. I mean, I was in my twenties and I was like, wow. He, I mean, he's leading from the front. He's not the general up on the hill watching his troops getting slaughtered. Awesome. I love it. What? book or books are on your must re-read list? I am actually going to start re-listening to Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, he is an amazing man. And I read his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is about behavioral economics, you know, the, the intersection of psychology and economics. He's funny and his stuff is mind blowing. And I'm going to re-listen to it starting after I finish this audiobook. Awesome. I've, I've heard a lot of great things about that book. Have yet to read it. So. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, for, it's one of those things like audio, audio wise, it's long. So if you can burn a credit, it's a good burn. You, know, you want those 20 hour ones, not those five hour ones. Totally. Absolutely. 
Uh, last question, and th this this one is it, it, people are going to be very familiar with this question, but I really like it, and so I'm going to ask mm -hmm. it even though it might sound um, uh, trite. And, and the question is, what's one thing you would tell your younger self that you know now? What's one thing that you would go back and, and tell your younger self to think about, consider, key into, that you now know and have learned through life and experience? Uh, tactically, I would say don't buy your condo in 2007 because that was the top of the market. <laughs> I think more big picture and this may sound silly but i would have told myself to have more fun in college like i i graduated presidential fellow phi beta kappa and i did not have any fun and now like in my 30s i'm making friends and having a blast which is awesome but life's too short you know what i mean like i lost four years of my life that i could have had 20 percent less work and probably triple the fun so i would say that Maybe you're having more fun now than oh, most people who slacked off then. Married, dogs, house, amazing technology career, great guys to talk to like you. This is amazing. It's the best time in the world for me. That's awesome. Matt, we've had a pleasure talking with you. Go out and buy his book. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's going to revolutionize your, your sales process. It's gonna, for sales reps, it's going to help you make more money. For, for sales managers and ops guys, it's going to make your sales reps very, very happy. So go check it out on Amazon, and thank you again, Matt, and uh, we'll have you on again very, very soon. Thank you both so much.